Support for this podcast comes from the patrons at patreon.com slash fmlfpl. Okay, welcome to another Fireside Chat. This is Alon. Yesterday we had Keith von Hemmen talking Manchester United. Last night, me and Walsh did our huge budget podcast. And today we're joined by Scott Willis from the Canon Stats Substack to talk about Arsenal. Scott, what's happening? I'm doing good. I'm excited to get back into doing this. Hell yeah. You're you're turning into the go-to guy. We had you last year and you're back again. I need to get more into doing actual uh, you know, fantasy stuff. You know, it's just I only have so much bandwidth for so many things, yeah. but man, I think like I think like I could do well with it. Yeah, oh for sure. I feel like they're just rabid dogs, all of us. Just like any data or insider ish kind of info. They're all they're all clamoring for it. But um just before we dive into Arsenal stuff, where can people follow you on social media, read your work and all that? So the the best place to read my work is uh, canonstats.com. I you know publish there with uh, my partner um, Adam Vogue, um, mostly on the Arsenal stuff. Sometimes we'll touch on some of the other things kind of uh, around the Premier League. Um, if you're on the Twitter X, um, find me at Scott J Willis. Um, you know, post more of my radars and those kind of fun things when you know things uh you know seem like they're in the news and I have some thoughts and opinions on them. The radars are very like retweetable kind of things. Like those <laughs> yes. get eaten up, right? Um, very fun. I think a fun place to start might just be ins and outs. Um, Cal Fiore is over the line. I think everyone kind of saw how good he might be in the Euros. I mean, not a lot of listeners to our podcast are watching Bologna every week. Um, so ha- do you envision him just immediately stepping in and being the first choice left back? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that is one of the big questions about Arsenal is uh, what is the you know the left back situation? It feels like there's like five names that could be yeah. um, a, you know a, a legit option to be used at Arsenal. Um, I think my expectation kind of coming in is that he's going to be the first choice. Um, but I've been kind of doing this um, in a little bit of a tier system where I think that there's certain guys that are like basically like nailed on starters. Like if they're fit, they're playing. Yeah. Um, and I think he's going to be in the category just below it where he's okay. first choice. Um, that's my expectation kind of coming into it. Um, it's tough, right? Cause we haven't even seen him, you know, even play in a friendly yet. Um, yeah. maybe tomorrow we'll see him get his first minutes. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm really going to be watching closely over the next two friendlies that Arsenal have, um, to try to get a clue of what the actual decision will be for, yeah. uh, the opening day match against Wolves. It doesn't it just feel so weird that there's just so few preseason games and the season is so close. And I this, I, this summer has gone by so incredibly fast. Yeah, um, it, it, it feels like we're just blinking, and you know we were um, at the end of the season, and the, the Euros, and now we have the Olympics going on, and it just yeah. feels like everything is yeah I've been compressed. All of my summer projects have not been able to get finished. <laughs> Unfortunate there, yeah. Because I was I was thinking about Calafiore, and I was like, well, rewind a year ago, almost like to the day, and we're all sitting here in preseason being like, oh, Timber's just the left back and looks incredible. Then obviously he had the unfortunate injury, didn't play again until, you know, what what was like last game of the season or something like that. And now I'm like, okay, I I don't really know where Timber's at health-wise and, you know, hopefully he makes a good recovery, but that's already two guys before you even (laughs) factor in like Zinchenko fighting over, you know, the same position. Yeah, I, I have a bit of a divergent opinion, I think, on Timber as left back, um, you know, as it being like the choice or like what we were thinking was going to happen. Um, if you bring yourself back a year, you know, what the situation was at Arsenal is that uh, Tommy Asu and Zinchenko were both hurt this time of year. So right. Arsenal's depth chart was kind of empty at left back. Mm. Um, I think that's one of the things that's actually really nice about having versatile players that um, Arsenal have really seemed to target. Um, over the last you know three or four years, is that you can have like options kind of switch over to be able to do it. But that's always been a nagging thing in my head. Is like we never got to see what it was when everybody was healthy to actually get a yeah. sense of what the the depth chart is. That's part of the problem with Arsenal and left backs is that almost every one of them um, has some sort of um, injury question with them. Um, that's always been a question with Tommy Asu. That's always been a question yeah. with Zinchenko. Um, 
hopefully that won't be a problem with Calafiori. Yeah, I mean, hopefully he's over it because in the past he's had his own injury issues. So I don't know. Yeah. Mikel, Mikel has a type, I guess. He likes a slightly injury prone, you know, <laughs> uh, weirdo at left back. Um, all right. So that, that you know, for FPL wise, maybe that's not somewhere we'll go. You know, I, I think one thing, um, actually, just if, if people haven't been super deep into Calafiori, like, you know, yeah. people might think, oh, he's a center back. Um, playing left back and he's not going to have necessarily some of like the attacking numbers that you might be able to see from a traditional left back. But if you, if you did watch any like stuff at Bologna, like he did not play yeah. center back like a center back. Yeah. Um, he was given an incredibly free role um, by Moda um, in a very kind of interesting setup at Bologna. So he often was um, saying, you know, playing almost as like a central midfielder. Mm -hmm. um he had really like aggressiveness of like being able to go forward be able to do things so um you know he is a you know a center back last year but i i wouldn't expect him to play as a super conservative left back when right. he goes and plays left back for arsenal yeah i mean maybe this is you know not a one-to-one -one comparison but it does sort of feel like they're just trying to find ben white 2.0 on the other side who's like he can overlap. Like California Fury used to just be a left back straight mm -hmm. up before the big injury, right? So like he can go forward, he can overlap, he can invert, he can defend, he can slide to a back three, you know, whatever, whatever needs to be the case. Yeah, no, I think that is kind of the the idea, right? It's uh <laughs> Arsenal have gone to this uh very aggressive, big, um, you know, kind of dual winning kind of team. Um, I think he fits that kind of role. Um, still a very high technical level being able to do things. I don't know how like much like the the assists kind of stuff is going to translate because he, mm. I still don't imagine him being a guy that really gets up the wing on the overlap to be able to do things. Um, but he might have more upside for you know attacking numbers than you might expect from a center back. Right. Or, I was know, actually going to ask about back. that because you know I think everyone who watched Arsenal specifically last season can imagine like get the ball to Saka. Ben White overlap all day, every day, mm -hmm. you know, 10 times a game. It's going Odegaard to Saka to, you know, Ben White overlap. But it doesn't feel like the buildup happens on the left nearly as frequently. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that must partially be a reason why, like, we're not going to see him overlapping as much, right? Like, it's just not settled possession on that left side as much, right? Or am I yeah, imagining and it that? Might no, it might change depending on the situation with the you know the left midfielder, um, if because that was a lot of times uh, you know Kai Havertz at the start Rice of the season guy. and um and, and it's not that I have again uh, probably a little bit different opinion than some people, but I, I thought Havertz played well in a type of profile that's a, you know an off ball kind of role, um, being able to do it. Um, Declan Rice, I thought did better, you know, being a little bit more of a on the ball, you know, more towards kind of what Granite Xhaka did the season before. Um, there's also the link to Mikel Marino, which I think would be something that's, again, I'm not sure if he's a, a full-time starter at the, you know, the left eight, or if it's, you know, a, a Rice kind of guy that comes in and or orients it. But either of those guys, I think, would give more balance to build up play on the left versus yeah. Havertz. And I don't think Havertz is completely done being as the left eight. So I think they'll still be, you know, sometimes to mix and match for Arsenal's perspective. All right. Well, let, let's go there because that's really interesting. I was going to ask you, like, how does Marino fit in? Because it seems like that'll just eventually happen with how many rumors there have been. But, you know, what I guess, like, it's a bigger conversation if we talk about it. sometimes it's going to be Marino, Marino or is he going to be sort of like the backup number six? And is Kai going to you know, just play all his minutes as striker this season instead of half a season because he was so good there? Or or you, what you just said, you you think Kyle Stoll gets some minutes at that left mid spot, maybe behind Jesus or something? I think if I did, again, I'm not, it's it's really hard to make a determination yeah. with Arsenal right now because it feels like, well, one, Arteta has never been uh, a guy who's like <laughs> willing to share his thoughts and opinions on like yeah. things that he doesn't have to. Um, he wants to keep everybody guessing on it, but my gut feeling kind of going into it is that Havertz is the, at least the first choice at striker. So I'd probably guess that he would get somewhere maybe like 75% of the minutes yeah. being able to do that. Um, Jesus has come back in this preseason and he looks healthy. Um, I know that was something that really, really um, sapped his ability at the end of last year. Um, he was playing with a knee injury where he had a bunch of fluid in the knee and you could just yeah. tell that he lost 
a lot of the burst that he kind of had from uh, the year previously. Um, so this preseason, he's looked a little bit better, but he still has some of the Jesus problems that you know everybody <laughs> knows and loves. Um, where you know he gets into good situations, can't quite finish them. Um, again, like I still like the player, and you know it's not like a problem, but it might be more of a problem if you're looking for goals and assists. Yeah, um, yeah. I think you'll have, the assists might be there, but the goals might not be there as much as you would like for a player getting in the situations that he's mm-hmm. getting into. So, and I, yeah. We just need one good finishing year, right? Like from an FPL perspective, right. just, it's one. Like, just one, just one year where he randomly is like three over his XG and he's just like scores twenty five goals. But I mean, right? Happen. That's that's what we need as an Arsenal team too, right? That if I think if Jesus has a plus finishing year, that is probably something that could potentially push Arsenal above Manchester City. I'm not betting on it, but oh it yeah, I mean, I'm a, Liber- I'm a Liverpool supporter. Like if Darwin just randomly has a good finishing year, which he's had. It randomly in the past, it's just like, oh, 25 goals, cool, you know, <laughs> like that. It's right, yeah, small sample, even a season is a small sample size, so yeah. Um, um yeah, so then I think Jesus, and I, I do expect Jesus to still get a fair amount of minutes because it's kind of looking like he's gonna be the the guy that um is a bit everywhere in the front line, yeah. So I, I expect he'll play a bunch still being able to do that. Um, and the left side, um, it's going to be interesting to see if it's either um, Martinelli or Troussard that, that starts it. Um, I, I think Martinelli is the better all-around player, but I think last year the big thing was that Troussard was scoring the goals. So you yeah. can't take the guy out that's scoring the goals. Um, I think it'll be a, an interesting fight to, to kind of start the year between them, um, although I'd give Martinelli a bit more of the, the advantage as the guy that's going to start with you know, more of the minutes, but I still expect them to be kind of almost like a, a 60 30 split. Yeah. Um, those games. What about, I mean, Jesus on the left at all? I mean, I know he, he did some wing stuff for Man City, I think probably while Arteta was still there when he was kind of just versatile, I could play anywhere guy. And I, you know, I would he, expect him to play left and right. Um, or at yeah, least it wouldn't surprise yeah. me to see him play left and right. Um, it'll be interesting, like that first game of the season. Um, will Saka be able to go right. a full 90 kind of a thing? So I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually Jesus to the right, um, at least to, to start the game, um, you know, and give uh, Saka not have to get thrown right back into things after a you know, really this long is, season overall. Everything I'm hearing is like it's scary to pick any of the Arsenal attackers because I don't know how they're like where they're going to play or when they're going to play because they're yeah again like that you mentioned the versatility earlier it's just like almost everyone except maybe Saka will can be moved all over the place or just not start. Um, yeah, I mean, Saka is the, the you know the only guy that I would expect you know yeah. outside of this first game against Wolves. That's yeah. the only one that I would like. Eh, he might he might come off the bench for that one. Um, right. But I guess again, it depends on how the next two friendlies go. If he starts the one on uh, Sunday, the eleventh um, against Lyon, I would expect him to start um, again that on Saturday. But yeah. if he doesn't start, I would probably expect him to come off the bench. But after yeah. that, I would basically say yeah, he's he's starting. He starts he's, every he's game. He's playing 60 games, right? He's going to be like Mo Salah, like unless he's like yeah. leg is literally falling off. That guy's playing, <laughs> which arguably still might not stop him because he yeah. limps off every game and just starts every game. So, um, I mean, behind him, Odegaard also is just a machine yeah. and just starts every game. And you know, I'm the, like, and I don't know if you play FPL, but you know, the price of the player matters a lot, as you might imagine. And Odegaard is significantly cheaper than Saka. He, you know, the goals and the shots came down a bit last year from the year before. But when you look from like the 21 22 season to 22 23 to last season, I mean, the shots are like all over the place in, you know, in terms of per 90. And, Mm -hmm. and I think of him as a very much a plus finisher. I mean, when you just see him strike the ball, you're just like, wow, you know, this guy can place a ball where he needs He's to place a, it. He's got a couple kind of like signature finishes, right? Yes. He loves to be the, the at the end of a cutback, um, kind of in between the top of the box and the penalty yeah. area. Like that, like if, if the ball is cut back to him there and he can get it onto his left foot, I feel really good about doing that. Um, same when like he kind of receives it in the half space and is able to, to kind of cut in towards like the top of the D. I feel like that's another spot where I like him shooting from. And anytime, obviously, like a player can get shots in the box. Yeah, of course. Feel good, but yeah, um, I, I do think that he has a couple finishes um, that I think he's worked a lot on to be yeah. good at. Um, yeah. Some of the other spots, maybe not quite as great. Right. 
And so when I look at someone like Odegaard, I, I find it hard. And, you know, this might just be the answer might just be dumb luck. But like, I find it hard to kind of like project his goals and project his assists. I mean, the assists we know are going to be like up, or, up around double digits, probably, right? Just so many touches, so many key passes, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, he'll just, he'll just run into assists. But, you know, the goals genuinely can vary between like five and 15. And, you know, kind of, I'm kind of lost with like trying to project which one it might be. Um, and I think that's a pretty fair assessment because I think the biggest question is what happens in the buildup play. Um, mm. Previously, um, in 22-23, he didn't need to do as much buildup play because um, a lot of times Arsenal's buildup um, was a 3-2 shape where it was uh, Party and Zinchenko at kind mm. of like the the base of a midfield. And he was able to stay further forward and, you know, focus more of his touches in the middle and final third. Um, And I think you could see that in his attacking numbers. Um, But Arsenal last year trying to bet in Declan Rice and not that Declan Rice is a bad passer, but I don't think he's an elite build-up player. I think he needs some guy to be able to kind of help him to be able to do things. So I think you, as we saw as the season progressed last year, Martin Odegaard, you know, one of the solutions was him coming further back um, and helping do more of the build-up play. Um, you know, there were times when Arsenal played with Jorginho in there, and you know, then he was able to stay a little bit further forward. So it really kind of depends on what else is there in midfield, and you know what his role is able to do. Because again, I think he's just a, a really good all-around player. Again, with yeah. the versatility that that Arsenal like, that he can be more of a traditional kind of box-to-box midfielder rather than it being, you know, just a, like a more creative type midfielder that stays further right. on the pitch. Yeah, and 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 Jaka was also there, right? In 22, yep. 23, right? Like doing tons yeah, so of- he was able to do more of that secondary progression when yeah. needed rather than needing Odegaard to be that secondary progressor. So maybe that's what I need to be looking at early doors. Is like, I mean, you just go to FB Ref and look at his progressive passes per 90. I mean, it's 6.77, 7.25, 7.67, and then last year was 10. Yeah, so like it's, it's really exactly good what you said. So yeah, hopefully those are down and the goals are up and he's in my fantasy team. We'll see. Um, another kind of guy sort of left 80 kind of dude that left the club. ESR Smith Rowe. Yep. Um, I'm just curious, like why a, there's no future for him at Arsenal. Like how does he not like, why does he not fit what Arteta likes out of that position? Was he hurt last year? And then, like, what do you expect from him, you know, on another team, assuming he's, you know, a fit and a, you know, first choice starter for them? So I think he had some niggle type injuries, like nothing that was like long term that kept him out. But there was some general kind of things that, you know, were just kind of nagging. Um, He did um, for the longest time have a a groin problem, which he did finally get surgically fixed. Um, So I think last year he was finally able to kind of recover from that. Um, it still takes you know some time to to get back to the best. Um, it, it's a little bit weird, right? Because he has a ton of talent. Like that's apparent when you watch him to be able to do things. And I think the reason he never made it into Arteta's plans is that I think Arteta really, really cares about the out of possession game. Yeah. Um, almost to um, you know fans frustration. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons that he persisted with, you know, Kai Havertz, even though, you know, he doesn't have the passing numbers or maybe, you know, some of these other things. Um, I think that uh, one of the Kai Havertz things that was so good is I think that his addition, um, especially over Granit Xhaka, even the year before, um, made a huge improvement in Arsenal's ability to stop teams being able to move mm. through the middle on them. Yeah. And when you look at you know some of like the players that haven't gotten the the minutes in that position, you know it's Fabio Vieira, it's Emil Smith Rowe, right. and both of them are more uh, on the ball players rather than you know off the ball monsters, you know defensive right. being able to do that. So I think that's something that Arteta really really likes to be able to see. Even though you know the Martin Odegaard, um, the guy like presses awesome. like crazy, he yeah. does all sorts of stuff. Um, even the wingers that Arsenal have, like that is a non-negotiable with like what they're expecting. Like you look at uh, Saka and Martinelli's like defensive numbers, like those guys have defensive numbers kind of like fullbacks. Yeah. Um, it's pretty crazy what he kind of asks his team to do. And I think that was part of the reason why he wasn't included. It's not necessarily because he didn't have the talent. I think yeah, that he has a certain very strict um, sense of what the team does when they don't have the ball. 
um, to be able to do it. Um, I'm excited to see what he can do at Fulham. Yeah. I think that's a, a really good um, landing spot for him to be able to do it. Um, I think Fulham need a player like him um, in the team to be able to kind of give um, some of the late runs in the box, like they on his debut was it yesterday? Like they yeah, he scored sure. right away, um, and it was a perfect like kind of a textbook Emil Smith Rowe play uh, for one touch layoff beautifully out to the wing and then a late run crashing the box Love to, that. you know, not home a, a goal. Although he's not a guy that's going to get a lot of headed goals, but um, <laughs> it was still just the, the classic crashing of the box yeah, type of yeah, thing from yeah. him. Um, and like going back to youth times, like that is a meal Smith row. Like he has a really good knack for finding, you know, spaces in the box. I think one of the things that's actually hurt him is he's kind of a tweener. Um, yeah. He doesn't really have a position like, Kind of has strikery ta- traits. He kind of has midfielder traits. He kind of has wing traits, like his ability to act. He's got like sneaky speed, yeah. um, good like on the ball, like for actually dribbling and taking on people. But it feels like none of them are his best position, like overall. Like he's going to have weaknesses and all. Um, but hopefully, at a team like Fulham, maybe they can, yeah, I guess, tweak the team more around him to be able to get more out of it. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. I think this is a good move for him. Like I'm sad to see him leave the club because we had such good memories with him and, you know, a guy that comes through your academy, you're always going to be rooting for to do stuff. But um, I'm, I'm really excited. Like I, there's no ill will at all for me. Like I'm going to be rooting for him. Except for when he plays against Arsenal. Right. Right, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 36 (laughs) great games a year and you know, two (laughs) where he has a illness and he can't play. A little niggling injury, which yeah. he, he likes to do. And, you know, Arsenal got a great fee back for him. So it was way more than I thought they sh- a team should pay for someone as injured as he's been. So, you know, kind of yeah, worked out. Yeah, it's, it's one of those weird ones, right? Because it's like, if he's at his best, it's a bargain. If yes. He's well, and not, fit. If, if he's at his yes. best and fit, <laughs> that's the big Yeah, and yeah. then the other part is like, well, he hasn't done that. So it's like, how do you pay for it? So it's kind of like they split the middle between the two. Yeah. So it is certainly more than I thought we were going to be able to get. This. Yeah, totally. Um, I guess just last question. Uh, I'll make it like a multi-parter, but I, I'm just wondering like if, if Arsenal can repeat how many set piece goals they scored last year, like is that repeatable or are teams going to sort of like learn and adjust? I see teams across the league are like hiring set piece coaches and all this stuff. Are Arsenal creating enough in open play for you to be happy and and comfy? And then I just just the follow up on top of that is like who who's going to lead the team in open play goals this year? I mean, I don't think that many people last year would have guessed that it's going to be a tie between Kai Havertz and Trossard. <laughs> so it's a, it's a tough question, but you know, I, I'm I'm wondering maybe Kai gets more minutes as striker, and it's just obviously him. But I'm I'm curious what you think. Okay, so for the set pieces, I think generally I would expect, you know, maybe some of that, there's always a little bit of variability in it, but I still expect Arsenal to create a lot of chances um, and get a lot of shots from set plays. I don't think that is going to change. Um, I think the big reason why is I think that they have good people at giving deliveries into the box. Um, So I think, you know, between Saka, uh, Odegaard, actually even Declan Rice has been really good. Is is Rice going to keep doing that? Because that was like a thing that, what was that second half ish of the season was just like, Oh my God. Yeah, He took, he took all the corners on the left-hand side. And yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens again, because he did a really good job at it. Yeah. Um, and then you also kind of look at, you know, the additions that Arsenal have added, like, all right, they're, they're added Calafiori, which is another big guy. Big dude. Um, I'm, I'm a Cal Marino. Like if he's in the team, like that's big another dude <laughs> uh, with elite aerial presence. Like that guy <laughs> can jump and win um, balls in the air like, like crazy. Um, and then I think uh, Gabriel Magalhaes is still going to be one of the the best, you know, center backs at attacking set plays. Yeah. So um, I don't know if they'll get the same exact number of goals, but I would still expect that this to be uh, an area Strength. where Arsenal, yeah, yeah, get a lot of shots and be able to do things and challenge and yeah, cause big problems. Um, open play shots, chance, chance creation, it's a bit of a worry. Um, it's it's not. Quite as bad of a you know a worry as maybe some of the other people might think because I think yeah. that some of the the things is just there's sequencing and um, game state effects. So um, Arsenal did have plenty of times where they created a lot from open play. So it's mm-hmm. not that they couldn't do it. Some of it is that they just took the foot off the gas to be able to kind of do things. Yeah. Um, there are some nagging issues that I have where 
um, Arsenal get the ball into good locations, but still just fail to generate shots. Like where right. they're turning down marginally decent chances to be able to shoot. Um, I'd like to see them go maybe not all the way to the Liverpool level of <laughs> um, like, let's just shoot on site. But I think yeah. they could learn a little bit more from that, that um, getting a decent shot is still a good outcome, even right. if it's not the perfect shot. Um, so I'd like to see a little bit more of that. I think that Arsenal's has enough like finishers in this team that they could be able to to get a little bit better, um, you know, from those kind of chance creations. Because you know, you look at Saka, Odegaard, even Martinelli, Trissard. I think these guys are good shooters. Um, they just need to take more shots um, in some of these kind of chances and um, see if we can create a little bit more chaos um, on some of these things to to be able to go um, the leader open play goals. Mm. Uh, that's Pop a tough on. one. I, th- really tough. I think you can almost say Saka, Havertz, or Martinelli, I think, as the three guys. Martinelli I think is an interesting I think, one. Yeah, because if you look at the the year previously, he did kind of lead the team in uh, in goals. Yeah. So, um, it's just like, is he going to go back to the hot finishing or is he more, you know, just the average finisher? That That was kind of like that one season, right? Yeah, it's a it's a tough one. I think he's got more shots in him. I think he had he was very. I think you know he had a, a foot injury that hit him like in the middle of the yeah. second half last year, and I think that took a lot out of him to be able to do it. So I'm not. It's again. I don't. I don't have a lot of confidence in, in yeah, any of these guys yeah. being. I think that it's going to be another season where Arsenal have a very even kind of distribution of goals. Um, I think you know the leader might be you know a guy who gets to 15. This season, right. I'm not sure there's a, right. a 20 goal guy, um, right. or at least uh, excluding penalties. Um, in right, this right, right. Havertz, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling Kai a little bit. I, I mean, if he's playing striker minutes, I and mean, you saw his shots go up, you know, the XG is going up with it, and he just needs to to play the minutes at striker, and I think the goals will follow. But you know, if I'm a little scared that we're just going to see, you know, him in midfield, and it's like a Trossard, Jesus, Saka lineup, and I'm just like, ah, oh, he got one shot and was barely in the box. You know, didn't touch the ball yeah. at all, you know. Um, but yeah, we'll see, I guess. But um, cool, dude. I think that's it. And uh, you know, thank you so much again for coming on. Yeah, no, hopefully the yeah, Arsenal might be a frustrating team to have uh, outside of Saka <laughs> yeah. um, to have on your fantasy team. Although maybe, you know, some of the center backs, maybe the they'll defenders be able to get are you good. clean sheets are yeah. good. <laughs> yep, they'll get you some goals, they'll get you some clean sheets. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would kind of stay, stay away from everybody else outside of Saka personally. Got it. All right. Cheers, dude. Thank you.